So to continue discussing writing history, I wanted to talk about a paper I wrote based on a workshop. Uh, this was a uh, basically a workshop is typically where you bring together several scholars, uh, usually a small number, to talk about a particular topic and to hopefully write papers and give presentations that help us to understand that topic better and then maybe publish it. And uh, this happened, this particular workshop was on the archives in Korea, was organized by my friend, um, Professor Jongwon Kim here. Uh, one thing that I think I just want to point out about Korean studies, it's kind of funny is her, this is Professor Kim here. This is also Professor Kim. This is Professor Kim. You can guess this, this is also Professor Kim. Um, I don't believe that was Professor Kim. This is also Professor Kim. Uh, this is actually not a Professor Kim. I believe he was Professor Wong and he was of Chinese ethnicity, but all the Koreans here were named Kim, which um, is not altogether uncommon. I just thought that was funny because it was like, hello, Professor Kim. It's good to meet you, Professor Kim. Have you met Professor Kim? Um, but to move on to the paper, right? So we published um, our papers based on this and here's mine. The late Chosun Korean Catholic archives documenting this world and the next. I want to just talk about what this paper is about. Archives typically consist of documents created for this worldly purposes, such as government census records. In contrast, the Korean Catholic archives consist of documents created primarily for the purpose of salvation, documents such as prayer books and lives of the saints, or for sainthood, documents showing the particular person died a martyr. So notice what I've done here is I try to say, okay, this is how we typically understand things. Here's how I'm going to build on it. Usually documents focus on this world. I'm looking at documents that focus on the next world. Moreover, many of these documents were international collaborations produced by Korean Catholics and foreign missionaries who at times even utilized sources created by the government that persecuted them. Many documents were sent to Europe, enabling them to survive anti-Catholic persecution and make Europe the center of Korean Catholic archives. However, beginning in the 1960s, institutions based on the peninsula, such as the Research Foundation of Korean Church History, worked to make Korea itself a center of archives and knowledge production. So I'm talking about how things have changed. In so doing, Korean Catholics sought to make these materials available to non-Catholic audiences and follow secular standards of the historical profession while trying to develop an authentically Catholic way of understanding their history. This article will trace the history and also act as an introduction to these archives for scholars interested in utilizing them. So you can read this very short introduction and understand what my paper is about, right? This is called an abstract. And if you can't write something like this, you don't really understand what your paper is about, right? And writing one can be kind of a way to develop your writing. If you can't write something short like this that says exactly what your paper is about, what you're trying to argue, you really don't understand yet. But I want to talk about how I introduce this paper. So I start off with a story of a document. Uh, after Alexius Huang Se-young, one of the few Catholic leaders who escaped the initial round of arrests that began the 1801 persecution, was informed upon and arrested, Hill Silk Letter, and I give the Korean inside Beksa, was discovered. As it included, in addition to an account of the martyrdom suffered by the Korean church up to that time, a plea for the Pope to raise an armada to threaten Chosun into tolerating Catholicism, he was punished with decapitation and posthumously dismembered. That letter was transcribed into government records and then copied into an anti-Catholic work, which a Catholic missionary subsequently obtained. He translated Alexius' letter into French and sent it to France, where Father Charles Dallet would include it in his History de Clis de Korea, History of the Church of Korea. All right, so I start off with a story. A story of a document created by one person, but then which led to multiple copies stored in different places. So that story gave you a sense of what I would be talking about. I continued, the story of the Silk Letter reveals the collaborative and international nature typical of the Catholic documents contained within the late Chosun Korean Catholic archives, as well as the fact that these works were deeply shaped by violent persecution. So I'm telling you what these documents tell us about this history. This article will explore the particular characteristics of these documents and the archives to which they belong by providing an overview of the documents, including who produced those documents, how, when, why, and under what conditions that make them up, and reveal the relationship between the pre-modern Korean Catholic archives and knowledge production. Moreover, we'll argue there's been a shift in the center of gravity of the archives from Europe, particularly France and the Vatican, to Korea itself in the second half of the 20th century. And while martyrdom has stayed central to knowledge production about late Chosun Catholicism, this shift has meant that rather than Catholics simply talking to themselves, 
there's been a movement among Korean scholars to address both Catholic and non-Catholic audiences. This has led these historians and theologians to seek to balance producing narratives that allow them to depict Catholicism as a positive force in secular Korean history and to produce research that meets professional historical standards while remaining distinctly Catholic. So you know what my paper is about. I have an argument. This argument is complex. I don't expect yours to be as complex or to be as expansive. But I'm basically trying to say there were these archives that contain these documents. I'm going to introduce you to these documents. I'm going to talk about how these archives shifted from being centered in Europe and to being shifted into Korea and how this greater Korean emphasis, um, greater control of Koreans rather than foreign missionaries of these documents, allowed and kind of forced Koreans, Catholics, to figure out what this meant for a Korean history. Right? We're Korean Catholics. How do we tell our story in a way that says that we're Catholics and that we're important to the Korean nation. Right. So I have a thesis, I have an argument, my paper is about something. So the paper begins, right, after the introduction, I have this first section, Koreans encounter Catholicism primarily through the various tribute missions sent by the Chosun court to Beijing. That's a topic sentence. Each one of your paragraphs should have a topic sentence that tells you what that paragraph is about. So, my first sentence, Koreans encounter Catholicism primarily through the various tribute missions sent by the Chosen Court to Beijing. The rest of this paper is talking, or the paragraph rather, is talking about what happened when those Koreans went to Beijing as part of that tribute mission. When I get away from that subject, I need a new paragraph. Right, so here I'm talking about when they were in the city, they would look around, they would buy new books, they would visit churches and missionaries, they would get books and bring them back to Korea. So I want to stress, when you have a paragraph, you need a topic sentence that says what the paragraph's about, what purpose it serves in your argument. And here I do it. Remember, I'm talking about archives. My purpose is here to talk about what documents Koreans got a hold of and what documents are part of the Korean Catholic archives. And this is how I start off doing that. Now, I then talk about how people were reacting to this. Attitudes towards the new religion varied, right? Here I'm talking about how Koreans became in contact with it. Now I'm talking about how people responded to it. And I talk about some people hated it. Some people, in contrast, thought it could be useful. But here I want to stress the importance of topic sentences. Many took this, op or I'm sorry, Koreans encounter Catholicism primarily through the various tribute missions sent by the Chosun court to Beijing. Then I talk about it. Attitude towards a new religion varied. So you could, theoretically, if you're reading a well-organized paper, you should understand what the paper is about just by reading the first sentence of every paragraph. Koreans encounter Catholicism primarily through the various tribute missions sent by the Chosun court to Beijing. Attitudes towards the new religion varied. So Koreans encountered, they reacted in different ways. So to give you another example, right, I then went on to say Koreans who had dabbled in Catholicism faced increasing pressure. For instance, lectures or th threats from family members or clan leaders after the 1785 incident, but very little violence. That would change in a few years' time. Sometimes you have to read the first two sentences. But in these two sentences, my topic sentences, I'm talking about how Korean Catholics, right, are going to suffer more problems. And I talk about how things get violent. The next paragraph is government persecution deeply marked the Catholic community and the documents it produced. And then I go on to talk about how it, w the, it was difficult for Koreans to make documents. But the fact that it was so difficult that they suffered so much persecution that many people writing the documents would eventually be killed that shaped their writings and led them to focus on the persecution they were suffering and their hope for God's help in this world and the next. So you can see I'm connecting this to the thesis. I'm talking, remember, this is a, about archives. Archives house documents. I'm talking about the documents and the historical context that shaped them. So if we go back and look at the topic sentences, Koreans encounter Catholicism. They react to it in different ways. Sometimes negative, sometimes positive. 
some Koreans become Catholics. Those Koreans who become Catholics face pressure. They face persecution. That pressure forms the documents they are writing. And I want to note too, right, so you can see how you can read this paper based on just the topic sentences. You have a strong topic sentence that tells us what you're going to do in the paragraph. The rest of the paragraph is just giving you pretty much evidence for why that topic is correct. You then need to think about how you do transitions. Right? So, oops, sorry. Um, here I talk about the threat of foreign invasion and the accusation of the threat in 1866. The brief French incursion led to a series of persecutions that continued sporadically until the 1870s, killing thousands of Catholics. So I ended this sentence talking about persecutions. So the first sentence of my next paragraph, the topic sentence, should somehow connect the idea of that paragraph to the preceding paragraph. So... Government persecutions of Catholicism naturally led to the production of documents. For instance, edicts were promulgated banning Catholic books in 1785 and 1787. So I've gone from describing persecutions to how those persecutions affected the documents that were being produced. This sentence, the sentence ending a paragraph, needs to be connected with the topic sentence in a way that serves as a transition. Here, what connects these paragraphs is persecution. But here I'm describing the persecutions. In this paragraph, I'm describing how those persecutions shaped Catholic books and documents related to Catholicism. I do that with my topic sentence, explaining how government persecution leads to the production of documents, and I describe what the documents are. This is not easy to do. It takes practice. But it's key to writing a good history paper that you are clear about your topic sentences and that you have transitions that move the reader easily from one paragraph to another. The, your reader should not have to sit and think deeply to make sense of what you've written. When they read, it should flow naturally. They should be guided without even thinking to understanding what you're trying to say. And I think it's interesting and I, I, I got to just point this out. A lot of times students will criticize a book or an article and say, I don't understand what the author is saying. They're re, they're, it's disorganized. I don't understand this. They're not being clear. And then students make that exact same mistake in their papers. The key to avoiding that, like I said, is to think deeply about your topic sentences and how you transition from paragraph to paragraph. To do that, you have to know your stuff. You have to have read the secondary and primary sources carefully. You have to have learned. If you know your stuff, writing is a lot easier. Where people struggle with writing is typically because they just don't really know. And I, I got to be blunt here. They don't know what they're talking about. Once you know what you're talking about, writing's easy. Getting to know what you're talking about is a little bit harder. But that's the idea of this class. Keep reading. Keep working hard. Keep writing. It'll get better. You'll get better at it. Don't worry.